can only be attributable to human error. You're Where will we go next? And another chance. No one, Mr. Monk. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. That is one big pile of shit. Hello, I'm Alex Daikaiju. I'm Jasmine with. I'm Eli Watson. And we are Cryptid Campfire. Woohoo! Ah, uh, hello everyone, and welcome to Cryptid Campfire. Throughout the years, we've looked at and discussed a lot of cryptids, and I mean a lot of cryptids. <laughs> Way back in the early days, we investigated the strange Mothman of Point Pleasant, following up with the menacing Goatman in a tri-state episode. We heard scary stories of a rogue dogman at Bray Road and even had secondhand experiences with that mythical place of wonder, Ohio, with amazing stories of magic and a wise frogman wandering the land. Hell, folks, the three of us have even dedicated an entire episode to something called the Bunny Man. <laughs> so welcome to today's episode. And in keeping with the theme of the intro, we're embarking on Skunk Ape Part 3. Oh, God. Oh, could you imagine? <laughs> no, no. We're across the pond today, and we're covering the Owl Man. Let's yes. go. Let's go. Uh, yes, the Owl Man, also known as the Death Raptor, mm -hmm. just in case you feel silly saying Owl Man out loud. Because <laughs> most cryptids we look into, it's like, oh, they're named this, like Sasquatch. That's a name for Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's also known as, you know, the forest man and this and that. And here it's like, we're, hey, we're talking about the owl man. And he's also known as the death raptor. That's a pretty metal name. Right. Death raptor. Where did that one come from? Do you guys know? Uh, I want to say uh, that was a name from a Lost Tapes episode. Oh, yeah. I did read something about that. Animal Planet did do a Lost Tapes episode. It is Animal Planet, right? Yes. Animal uh, Planet. And I don't know if they just said we can't call an episode Owl Man. We'll get laughed out in the ratings. Yeah. I don't know. But yes, we are, as Alex said, across the pond. Was that, uh, were you done with your intro? Did I cut you off just now? No, no, no. no. Okay. The, the, the talking stick is yours. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Um, so we are going to Monin Smith, which is a village in the civil parish of Monin in South Cornwall, England, UK. Yeah, I looked up what civil parish meant. Okay. It basically, let's see, the exact terminology was it is a territorial designation, lowest tier of local government below districts and counties. Basically, what I can infer is that it's a bunch of villages which are not big enough to be called towns or cities, but that have just been grouped together, yeah. basically. And I, th I think there's also uh, something about it where it has to deal with, like, church, where it's, like, uh, one parish has, like, one, like, pastor or, like, preacher hmm. or something like that. Um, I should have written it down because I also did look it up, but I didn't make note of it for whatever reason. Um, I was more interested in the geographical location, uh, which is approximately three miles south of Falmouth. And Monon Smith itself showcases famous Victorian gardens and also allows tours of its notable historical churches, as I mentioned. Um, and located about a mile from the village center is St. Monin and St. And St. Stephen's Church, which is an old stone church with a cemetery on the grounds and a high tower at one end, um, surrounded by woods, overlooking the sea. And this, my friends, is where sightings of the Owl Man take place. Yeah, dude. Let me take this opportunity to thank you all for watching Cryptid Campfire and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. 
Yeah, keeping in line with that kind of like death metal approach we were talking about with Death Raptor mm-hmm. is it mostly stakes stays around the giant tower of an old kind of decrepit church. Yeah, which I think, you know, we've talked about a lot of cryptids before that show up in certain areas like sometimes it's in this town sometimes it's in that town sometimes it's this many miles away from the last place it was seen seems to me like all of the owl man sightings happen right here in this cemetery like this very um direct area around this church yeah i would agree Mm -hmm. um what did you guys get i mean this is one of those things where it's like owl man what do you think it looks like (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It looks like an owl man. Well, first of all, I want to draw attention. Owl man. This is now in the long list of man cryptids. It's like frog man, moth man, goat man. What else is there? Dog There's man. A, dog dog man. man. He had a uh... spider man. Yeah, <laughs> spider man, uh, Batman, <laughs> dare say. <laughs> no, I just, I think it's wild that there are so many bunny man (laughs) remember that one yeah speaking about putting together the cinematic marvel cryptid universe you just have a lot of man cryptids running around bunny man uh bunny man no way from home (laughs) but but i don't know where what did you get for average height like i read like five feet tall five to six feet tall red eyes dark gray or brown feathers uh and large sharp talons Mm -hmm. uh wingspan approximately 10 feet and likes to make well i should maybe not likes to make but does make a loud hissing or screeching noise Mm -hmm. and that's about it it doesn't really have any other like wild and kooky features like it's this it's it's not some sort of like hybrid cryptid that has the head of one thing and the tail of another and whatever ever else um it's just a giant owl although i did i did sometimes see some things where like they t- it was described as being like a man owl hybrid but from what i gathered mostly is it's just a very large like owl like an abnormally mm-hmm. large owl the size of a man it, it doesn't glow in the dark or it doesn't shoot laser beams like some cryptids we've covered. Uh, it good. is interesting, right? It's a good thing it doesn't. You, <laughs> men- you mentioned that it, uh, yeah, some people say it's like a man-sized humanoid owl creature. Uh, most of the art I was looking at, people tend to draw it looks like almost a big bird with little tiny human legs attached to it. Uh, somebody drew a big buff one, which was pretty good. <laughs> it looked, hmm. like, it looked like Arnold with an owl head. It was posing a little bit too for the camera. Well, that kind of reminds me of the Mothman statue in Point Pleasant. Oh my which, God. With the, uh, with the tick booty and the rock hard abs. Yeah, dude. dude. But I mean, Owl Man gets compared to Mothman like all the time. Mm-hmm. Who Do we know who did that uh, Mothman statue? Not off the top of my head, but I'm sure we could find out. Yeah. I'm just curious because that's a that's a big statement to put to the world. Yeah, and I actually think that statue is based off of a Frank Frazetta drawing mm. of Mothman, which he did for a cover for the Mothman Prophecies back in the day. It makes sense. Uh, you know what? That's so funny that they gave him like the big Frank Frazetta butt then too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes sense, right? His name is Bob Roach, the guy who made the Mothman statue. Interesting. Uh, well, we salute you, Bob Roach, and your Frank friends that have butt sculpting skills. Oh, he passed away in 2015. Mm. Rest in peace. I uh, didn't even know the man was sick. So without further ado, let's get into the first sighting. Yeah, and it's pretty uh, certain when what like the first sighting was because there's a lot of cryptids where it's like, oh, well, we couldn't really track down what the first sighting was, but it seems like there's consensus that the first sighting ever of 
The Owl Man took place on April 17th, 1976. And we know this because of an internet forum on topsecret.gov, a post by Black Yoshi69. Uh, the man is back. He's back. <laughs> no. We um, we so <laughs> the story of the first, I almost said Mothman, the first Owl Man sighting. So we've got Don Melling. And his family, who were from Lancaster, England, they were out on holiday for the Easter weekend, and they were visiting Monin, which was home to just over 1,300 residents at the time. Um, while spending the day, and feel free to pop in if I miss something or am wrong, uh, while spending the day at their cottage, Don Melling's two young daughters, June and Vicky, who are 12 and 9, uh, they went exploring in the woods, you know, they just went about their day and took a little walk and they arrived at the church and caught sight of something big and scary flying in the air above the tower. Um, the creature was described as looking like a large man covered in feathers and having two large wings. The feathers were dark gray in color and appeared to also be black in some areas. Um, the monster lacked noticeable facial features and hands, but had long feet with large talon-like claws. So naturally, they got scared, ran away, went back to their parents and told their father what they had seen. And after hearing the description of what his daughters had seen, Don took his, I, I don't know how true this is. I don't know if this is cor corroborated or, or what like the facts are, but supposedly he took his children to the police station to report the sighting. Um, I don't know what happened with that. Um, supposedly the incident was investigated by the local police but the investigation didn't turn anything like nothing came of it um but after they went to the police station to make this this report they came back and they packed up and they left mm -hmm. like they cut their yep. vacation short by three days and just got the heck out of town on melling said this family vacays over mm -hmm. it's too cray cray for me yeah they were so unnerved he left a two-star review on Trivago. Mm. Oh. They should have called the price line negotiator. Well, they should have known from the commercials. Yeah. Uh, you know don't, don't visit the town of Mawin unless you're down with the Owl Man. Now, were there any... I know we're going to get talking about something specific in just a minute, but were there any other details that you guys came across from the story that I might have left out? no or was that that's the basics right that's the gist that, that's more than actually i found there's a few oh, details really? that you were that you had that like the age and um of the kids and also I, the thing that i was confused was i had seen some info talk about them going to their police report or to do a, a report with the police but one story i saw said they were so unnerved they ran straight to a police station mm. from the courtyard but that is or from the churchyard but doesn't make sense if you're new in town and you're yeah. on vacation i don't know so yeah but that, it does fill in a few gaps for me mm -hmm. cool now in my first couple or so readings about this incident um that was essentially all the information given like what we just shared is about all i saw on the first one or two sites that i was reading about this on but Obviously, I, I cross reference. I don't just take something from one source and say this is what happened because things can be wrong. There can be confusion. You know, I like to have a good variety of sources, which you'll be able to look at our sources when you go to our blog. We are going to have all of our sources and research uh, things there. Um, that's kind of a mid show plug. We'll mention it again at the end. But um, as I dug a little deeper, I found that this report from the Melling family was apparently given publicity by the one and only Anthony Doc Shields. Now, we've talked about Doc Shields uh, before on the podcast, specifically in our Nessie miniseries from our World Tour Tome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a quick recap of him. Modern day wizard, surrealist, performer who did sea monster invoking rituals with naked witches who i'm pretty sure were his daughters uh and he took the uh he took what's known as the muppet photo of the loch ness monster 
Um, he insists that he did not fake those photos, but given his history and character, many researchers speak with absolute certain certainty that those photos were a hoax, um, but he claims they were not. Now, I don't know how much we want to get into talking about Doc Shields today because he is highly involved with the Owlman. And I mentioned this to Eli earlier off air. I feel like we could do an entire episode on Doc Shields. Maybe that's what this will be. Maybe this will be the Doc Shields episode with a little bit of Owlman. We'll find out as we go along. No, it's more Owlman than Shields more for sure. Okay. Uh, well, Doc, there- Doc Shield is like is like the Hulk tour. He'll just keep kind of keep popping up in each story. And he's not going to get in a tile episode to himself, but he'll get his backstory total out over different cryptid stories. Gotcha. Yeah. So um so I don't know if we just want to leave it at that for Shields, like with his background and stuff. Um and then keep going with Owlman stuff. Well, I need to, this is going to clear up a lot of things, <laughs> okay. okay, but I'm going to be talking for a little bit here. So you are correct in saying that Doc Shields. There's no, there's no D by the way. It's S-H-I-E-L-S. Yeah, I said Shields. 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 You're correct in saying that he is the reason that that story of the Mellings being is is so popular is because of his involvement with it but he was not the first one involved with the case nor the first one to break that story okay interesting so Mm. i'm gonna get to this in a very roundabout way okay (laughs) um (laughs) that step number one of every public speaking (laughs) I just I, I just had to make sure the pipes were clear. You know, much of my research today comes from a fellow named Jonathan Downs. He I'm not sure if he's still the director or if he just was, but he was the director of the Center for Fortean Zoology based in the United Kingdom. He wrote a book called Owlman and Others, which I believe was first published in 1996, in which he talked with Doc Shields extensively, considers Doc Shields a friend of his. Unfortunately, I could not gain access to his book in time for this episode. Mm -hmm. But I did find on the Center for Fortean Zoology website through some wacky means, I was able to access this old article that Jonathan Downs wrote that kind of breaks down a lot of these instances or, or not the instance, what am I trying to say? The, the whole Owlman case. <clears throat> now, remind me again, I'm sorry. I know you said you went through some wacky means, but the website, the web page that you were reading is supposed to be like a direct website from jonathan downs or is it like something that someone took like someone read his book and then typed a bunch of stuff up it's what you read was supposedly written by jonathan downs 100 percent, (laughs) probably that's not 100 percent. okay okay listen this this is what happened okay i found on some random forum forum people discussing the owl man and they're like well i was reading this article by Jonathan Downs and it was a link to the Center for Fortean Zoology website Mm -hmm. so I clicked it and it said 404 page not found and I was like interesting cover up eh and so I tried it in various ways because I thought it might be typed in wrong or something Mm -hmm. still 404 page not found so I copied that original link from that forum into the Wayback machine and it pulled it up and in recent years, I went back to like 2015 at first and it said 404 page not found. So then I went back to like 2009 and it pulled up the web page. Mm. So it was, it's like an official thing from the Center for Fortean Zoology website, but it's just not up it anymore. anymore. Yeah. So, okay. and it's Jonathan Downs referring to himself. So that's why I say 100% probably. So unless it's some other dude an assistant of jonathan downs who he's like just just make it sound like i wrote it you know like gotcha <laughs> J- J- jonathan downs with a z yeah yeah 
so in this he in this very long article he has a transcripted letter or part of a letter that doc shields wrote to him okay. concerning the case with the mellings and it should be noted that don melling had heard of doc shields before and in fact blamed doc shields for what his daughters had witnessed because he thought he was behind it interesting did he think he like summoned him or something like that probably or... probably something like that gotcha. Whoa. and Got a so reputation, eh? yeah and that'll come up later um uh, again so this is what verbatim what that letter says or at least the part of it that's in the article a very, a very weird thing happened over the Easter weekend. A holiday maker from Preston, Lancaster, told me about something his two young daughters had seen. A big feathered bird man hovering over the church tower at Monon, a village near the mouth of Helford River. The girls, June 12, and Vicky, daughters of Mr. Don Melling, were so scared that the family cut their holidays short and went back three days early. No. What? <laughs> Sorry, you just what's happening right now? You just stopped reading I'm and having, said I'm, no. having, I'm having some major cognitive dissonance. All right. I'm just now more confused. Continuing on where I left off. <laughs> We're so scared that the family cut their holiday short and went back three days early. This really is a fantastic thing. And I'm sure the man wasn't just making it up because he's been told I was on a monster hunt. I couldn't get the kids to talk about it. In fact, their father wouldn't even let me try, but he gave me a sketch of the thing drawn by June. There have been no reports, so far as I know, of anybody else seeing the Birdman, even if it turned out to be just a fancy dress hang glider. You'd think someone else would have spotted him, but Manon is not a place for hang gliding. I really don't know what to think. It's as if... A whole load of weirdness has been let loose in the Falmouth area since last autumn. Mm -hmm. What is he referring to? What is he talking about? What do you yeah. mean? These What's are the this questions. Guy on about? Well, <laughs> or in keeping with tradition of we're in the UK, what's all this then? <laughs> what's all this then? So, Jonathan Downs' book called Owlman and the Others. The Others refers to. Oh, it's Owlman and others, not the others, but others refers to all the strange happenings that were happening in Cornwall from 1975 to 1977. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Downs lists some of these strange things very briefly in the blog. I think they're worth mentioning. So there's wide reports of UFOs. Mm -hmm. There's Morgar, the Cornish sea serpent, which Doc Shields was trying to summon with the use of his naked witch daughters and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's big cats being seen and of course the owl man and one report that i found really disturbing in a scene out of a hitchcock movie uh. is a woman was trapped inside of her house while the while like hordes of birds were just beating themselves to death against her walls mm -hmm. Ooh -hoo. yeah there were also reports of teleporting cows oh, as geez. well as just some some like natural anomalies such as floods droughts heat waves um and yeah a whole load of weirdness in southern cornwall yes yeah that place is popping uh and i think people say it might be due to what lane li or landlines Ley lines. Ley lines. Ley lines. Well, landlines. They, they put them everywhere. It's been a whole wo load of weirdness ever since. Yeah. I was going to bring those up a little bit later. Um, but since you've, since we kind of talked about them right now, just a quick note. Let me do a quick search in my notes here because I don't exactly remember which part of my notes I have them in. But ley lines. I wasn't able to look into it as much as I wanted to. So I just kind of found a brief description. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have a very short turnaround for this. We have weekly episodes, so it's not like we can spend 
a month or more diving deep into one certain topic. That's the reason why we don't get access to a lot of the books that would be beneficial to our episodes. Um, so I didn't look super into ley lines, but basically to those who believe in ley lines, the, the concept is this. There are lines that crisscross around the globe, like latitudinal and longitudinal lines that are dotted with monuments and natural landforms and carry along with them rivers of supernatural energy. So along these lines, at the places they intersect, there are pockets of concentrated energy that can be harnessed by certain individuals. So it's like a supernatural, like, it's like, oh my gosh, this crazy thing is geographically connected to this other crazy thing that's happening on the other side of the world and they intersect and it's that kind of thing. So people think that there's ley lines where this church is in uh, Monin. Didn't I talk about that fairly recently too on one of our previous episodes in just the last tone? I don't, I don't recall. If you did, I might not have been there. It might've been a tall tale. Um, did we talk about them with Skinwalker Ranch? No, we've, we've I thought we've mentioned ley lines a few times before, mm -hmm. because like Jasmine said, sometimes one will be uh, like Stonehenge, I think, is located on one, they say. Or oh, yeah. is that what we're talking about? The Berger episode mm. with Carrick, I talked about uh, we were talking about interdimensional windows opening. That's what I was getting to is like this. They say they could be portals, right? Yeah. And. Because John Keel was the one, I think he popularized the idea of ley lines in his book, The Eighth Tower. But, or maybe it was the Mothman Prophecies. I can't remember. Both of them run together. They crisscross a little bit. Well, because The Eighth Tower is like almost a direct sequel to the Mothman Prophecies, but minus the Mothman. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but, <laughs> uh, uh. anyways. Um, and I have to correct something I said earlier in this episode. It's it it appeared, and this is why I got so confused a little this while. This is why ago. I said no in the middle of reading a sentence. No, no. yes, no. <laughs> it was. So it appears to me that Doc Shields may have been one of the first people to receive the report from the Mellings, but he was definitely not the first one to publish it, like out in the open. Okay. Do you know who was? Because yes. Okay. Are you going to answer? Are you going to tell me? Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. Okay. So, where I was going when before we got distracted with ley lines and everything like that is the strange events of 1975 through 1977 in Cornwall mm -hmm. were first collected in a book called Morgar, Monster of Falmouth Bay by a man named Anthony Manon Peller, which is a pseudonym, but not for Doc Shields. Mm. Jonathan Downs is very stern in that assertion. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know who it is, but. <laughs> Even though they both share the first name, Anthony. Anthony. I, get, I, I don't know. It gets really weird. I have some theories. We'll get into it later. But this book gives the report of the Melling sighting. Mm -hmm. and Which apparently came from the letter that Doc Shields wrote to somebody, but I don't know who that somebody is. It sounds to me like that somebody might have been Jonathan Downs, since you already read excerpts from the letter. Yeah, I think it's Jonathan Downs. That's certainly like it didn't say for sure in the blog. I I kind of went out of my way and I said it was to Jonathan Downs, but it it's definitely like worded in a way to where it seems like it was written to Jonathan Downs. Because when I was doing my reading, a lot of the articles that I was reading about this first sighting would say things like. In 1976, Doc Shields wrote a letter telling the story of blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, well, who did the letter go to? Who, who was he writing this to? Like, you guys are giving me quotes and excerpts from the letter. So who was he writing this to? Because what he wrote in that letter is apparently what ended up in the pamphlet, which came out that same year, which is the pamphlet that you just named. And according to Shields, as far as I know, he was approached 
by John Melling with the story, which seems to match up with what you said because Melling apparently already knew who Shields was, potentially blamed him for it, so he went to him. Um, I have a quote I'll read later because it comes up later, but um, Doc Shields, I don't know if he lived in Monon or just in Cornwall in general, but he kind of had the reputation for being hey, this is the dude who's into weird stuff. If you've seen something weird, you go to Doc Shields and tell him about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like out of the question that Don Melling would be like, hey. Associated a weird owl monster with him. And be like, what's your deal, dude? You're freaking out my daughters. You know, I guess he wouldn't have sounded like that. because he. (laughs) But, (laughs) and it is confirmed by Downs that this pamphlet that we've been discussing written by an unknown author who we may have some hunches on Mm -hmm. who the true identity is was read by the next witnesses Mm -hmm. of the owl Mm -hmm. man now the question that i wrote in our group facebook message was what was the order of events that this happened now obviously we're going to tell the story of the next witnesses but i need some clarity and i don't know if you guys can offer it to me about what the order of events was did the pamphlet come out these next witnesses read the pamphlet then the witnesses had an experience and like oh my gosh that's the thing we read about and then they contacted shields or was it they had an experience then the pamphlet came out and they read it and they were like oh my god that's what we saw then they contacted shields do we have any clarity on that yes yes we do they read it before they saw it. Okay. Great. And I have some direct quotes we'll get into in a minute, but let's describe the sighting, the encounter, how it went down. Sweet. Who wants to do that? Uh, I just have a very general overview. Okay. I'll, I'll read aloud and you guys can take it away and fill in all the, the meaty details because okay. a lot of the sources I had were real, built, real bare bones. The second is a classic camping story. Uh, according to Shields, uh, Owlman was reported again on January 3rd by two 14-year-old girls identified as Sh- Sally Camp- Chapman and Barbara Perry, who were aware of the Owlman tale. Yes, um, I think uh, you meant July, not January. Oh, yes, July. Uh, according to the story, the two girls were camping when they, uh, nearby uh, the church, uh, when they were confronted by a big owl with pointed ears as big as a man, glowing eyes, and pincher like claw feet. Uh, this time, the creature had apparently made a ghastly hissing sound before vanishing up into the trees again. The owl man was, oh, and then it goes on to say the owl man was seen again the next morning, mm-hmm. I think by different witnesses. So, yeah, Sally and Barbara, they were camping, like you said. The story that I read had a lot of extra details and I'm not sure if that was just creative liberties or if that is like direct from the story or not. But basically Sally had been standing outside of the tent and then she turned around and saw this creature, made eye contact with it, had red eyes. She froze in terror and watched as it stretched out its wings and hissed at her. And then Barbara stuck her head out of the tent and also saw the creature. Um, and it flapped its wings and let out a hiss and took off into the sky. Um, and they obviously, again, were scared, but they stayed in their tent all night. And um, they also apparently made sketches of what they saw as well. And Chapman is quoted as saying this. It was like a big owl with pointed ears as big as a man. The eyes were red and glowing. At first, I thought it was someone dressed up playing a joke, trying to scare us. I laughed at it. We both did. Then it went up to the air and we both screamed. When it went up, you could see its feet were like pinchers. And so these girls had read the pamphlet that we were just talking about. They had not yet seen the owl man as Eli tells it. Then they had their experience and then they contacted Shields to say, yo, we saw this thing too. Okay, okay, what, okay, okay, okay. What okay. other things can you add to the story? A lot. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> a lot. I'm excited. Okay, did, I can't remember if Alex mentioned it or not, but did you guys get the hissing sound? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so hissing the hissing sound. sound is what caused, was it Barbara. Sally to turn around? Mm-hmm. She looked, she saw the owl man had its wings outstretched barbara came out because she was like 
what's making that hissing sound saw it so they both saw it then it took off they described it as being about 60 feet away i thought you were gonna say 60 feet yeah giant (laughs) tore down uh, the trees as it walked toward him (laughs) and then i too came across the next day it was cited by multiple people near monon church although jonathan downs says like that didn't happen basically Mm. like that's just kind of like a internet rumor Mm. it's just like added on but anyways so i'm a little confused about how this went down because this suggests that doc shields is really famous (laughs) okay so sally and barbara is he is but you'll see what i mean so sally and barbara went down to the beach because there's uh monon actually has a nice coastline with a pretty Mm -hmm. beach on it so the morning after their encounter they went down to the beach where they saw tony as as jonathan down calls him tony all the time oh tony Tony. Oh, it calls him Tony, Tony the Tiger. Tony the Tiger. <laughs> so I guess he's down at the beach. Sorry, I, this I is the same day that they saw it? The day the morning day. after. The morning after. And he just happened to be at the beach? He just happened to be at the beach. And they were like, hey, and this is straight from Jonathan Downs. They were like, hey, you're Doc Shields, aren't you? And he's like, yes, I am. They're like, well, check out what we saw last night. And that's when they told him the story. And he was like, and, and that's where that quote comes from, Jasmine, the one that you read from Sally. Barbara actually added a few more details. She said, it's true. It was horrible, a nasty owl face with big ears and big red eyes. It was covered in gray feathers. The claws on its feet were black. It just flew up and disappeared in the trees. And Doc Shields says at that moment, he was skeptical that they were, he he thought they were trying to hoax him, basically. And so he was Hoaxed like, <laughs> he was he's, like, he he's was like, youths. he's like, I got an idea for this. So he split them up and had them draw pictures of what they had seen. And they both drew more or less the same thing. They both added notes to the bottom or to the back of the page. And I'll read those notes right now. So Sally's drawing read. I saw this monster bird last night. It stood like a man, and then it flew up through the trees. It is as big as a man. Its eyes are red and shine brightly. Barbara's red. Birdman monster seen on 3rd of July, quite late at night, but not quite dark. Red eyes, black mouth. It was very big with great big wings and black claws, feathers gray. Hmm. And actually, and this is kind of interesting, when the two girls compared their pictures, Sally thought that Barbara drew hers wrong. Everyone's a critic. Everyone, everyone's a critic. <laughs> you know? Jeez. So that happened. And then, see, and then this is where the timeline compounds. Because I don't know if you guys would have come across this one. But another sighting happened that day. Oh, so I guess there was a sighting. That happened the very next day. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is this is the tale of that sighting. And this is supposedly happened at the same time that Doc Shields was talking to Sally and Barbara on the beach. Okay. According to the timeline. I don't know how they confirm that if neither of if none of them were there, but what do you mean none of them were there? They're on the beach while someone else is having another sighting. Yeah. You would have known, hey, I was at the beach at 1 p.m. That person saw something at 1 p.m. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, so the woman was named, or not actually, it wasn't a woman. It was a young girl, yet again, named Jane Greenwood. And she wrote to the local newspaper. So Doc Shields didn't find out about this. So I'm assuming maybe the next day, maybe even a couple of days out. She wrote to the local newspaper, the Falmouth Packet, that I would... I am on holiday in Cornwall with my sister and our mother. I, too, have seen a big bird thing. It was Sunday morning, and the place was in the trees near Manon Church, above the rocky beach. 
It was in the trees, standing like a full-grown man, but the legs bent backwards like a bird's. It saw us and quickly jumped up and rose straight up through the trees. It has red slanting eyes and a very large mouth. The feathers are silvery gray, and so are his body and legs. The feet are like a big black crab cl crab's claws. We were frightened at the time. It was so strange, like something out of a horror film. After the thing went up, there were crackling sounds in the treetops for ages. Our mother thinks we made it all up just because we read about these things, but that is not true. We really saw the bird man, though it could have been someone playing a trick in a very good costume and makeup, but how could it rise up like that? If we imagined it, then we Im both imagined it at the same time. Hmm. That's, you're correct in saying that. Uh, I might not have come across it because I did not. Something just hit me though, as you were reading that one that I, I think is interesting. We keep talking about how this is an owl man and how it's always just a giant owl, but I'm just now realizing that none of the accounts make any mention of a beak. You would think if it was an owl man, it would have a beak, but nobody says anything about a beak. They say just a large mouth. Yeah, that's true. But two things, two things are running across my mind right now. I think owls have pretty small beaks when compared to other birds. Am I wrong? I mean, they still have beaks. They still have beaks, but also I noticed like some birds, at least from pictures I've seen, they have like freakish looking mouths. Like they don't really look like beaks, you know, they just like, they're like get, gashing holes in the face, you know? I'd have to disagree. No, I, you haven't seen the pictures I've seen, not of owls, but of different birds okay. where it's just like, they're freaky looking. Like, I, I mean, know, owls birds, are freaky looking. Birds freak me out in general. I don't like birds. <laughs> Av avians are very uncomfortable to be around. <laughs> Anyways, that was a bit of a tangent. It's okay. It was a good one, but maybe you're right. Maybe they're it's a, it's a good thing to bring up but also it when we looked at mothman of point pleasant uh you could say oh they call him mothman but he doesn't have the thorax of a moth <laughs> i was like uh, I to point out all of my inconsistencies alex <laughs> i'm just saying if there's one thing cryptozoology's been known for it's not very good naming all right all right all right so that was another sighting What's the next sighting that you guys got? I got what the next one that I got happened in June of 1978. The next sighting. So it kind of like the owl man just disappears for a little bit. It not that long. I mean, it's not like it's gone for years. A little just more two sporadic. Years. From 1976 to 1978. Yeah, I mean, that's not a long time. It's a long time. Think about what happened two years ago. Think about today. <laughs> Think about the hype that he was building. What happened two years ago, Eli? Remind me. January 12th, 2020? We were living in a different world. We were. <laughs> <laughs> we, were. Uh, we were so young and, and, and full of life back then. Okay, so, so our man goes into hiding for two years. The next sighting took place in June of 1978. Doc Shields apparently got a phone call from a man named Ken Opie, who told him that his daughter, who was 16 years old, had seen the owl man during the first of the week in June. Miss Opie, as they call her, claimed to have seen a devil fly up within the trees surrounding the modern church, and it was described exactly the same way as the previous sightings. That is about all I have. That is all I have. Yes. So, again, a young girl bearing witness to the owl man. Does this have any relevancy? We'll find out. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later. But it's interesting. It is interesting, and it 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 may the the problem compounds with the next sighting. So, on August second of the same year, three young unnamed French girls claimed to have had an encounter with the owl man and this is really dubious this is like super super like sus sus, sus. 
Because this comes from Doc Shields, who says he was contacted by the landlady of the boarding house at which the three young French girls were staying at. And it finally hit me. Landlady, landlord, Britain, lords and ladies. I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. Anyways, that I'm serious. I had that revelation. Revoli- you know <laughs> that reckoning <laughs> the reckoning so according to the landlady so according to doc shields what the landlady said to him was that these three girls told her he said that she said that they said <laughs> yes uh, this he, is what he psychically <laughs> predicted it all that they were frightened by something very big like a big furry bird with a gaping mouth and round eyes. He left his info so that they could talk to him when they had calmed down, but they never reached out. Hmm. I have another short letter here from Tony Shields. He wrote to Janet and Colin Board of the Fortean Picture Library. The owl man is certainly back in business, it seems. I poked around his area around Old Monon Church a couple of days ago, and the atmosphere was positively crackling with odd presences, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. No, Doc, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> As he nudged everyone in the side, if you know what I mean. I like the word choice of crackling. Crackling with the treetops. What does it mean? What does it mean? <laughs> So, yeah, okay, so we've been talking about how basically every single sighting Mm -hmm. has been traced back to Doc Shields. Every Mm -hmm. single one. Old Tony himself. Grubby little fingerprints all over him. Mm -hmm. And this is why lots of people branded the Owlman as a hoax. You know, Doc Shields is known as this crazy guy who does all this crazy stuff and it's important to note that he made his living before he was invoking sea monsters and all of that. He made his living being a stage magician. And like, Mm. I don't know if this is the proper terminology, but he was basically in the circus. Like he had a group of people that he would travel with and like perform with. Um, He was, I I read a quote uh, where he called it a marvelous madness about it all. And he did like tent shows with people. And so he had this reputation of being, this crazy guy who did weird things so like people start talking about all these owlman sightings and they're like wait doc shields is involved it must be fake it must be a publicity stunt yeah uh, specifically the first person that i could find who kind of laid some accusations against him was this fella named mark chorvinsky of strange magazine who and this was in 1978 This is right after those two new sightings came out. He said, he basically what Jasmine just said, he basically made it all up because everything was tied to him. Mm -hmm. However, Jonathan Downs defends his friend, Doc, Tony Doc Shields. And this is what he says. I'm going to read this word for word. Such people and such people were referencing the skeptics. The haters. The haters out there yeah such people do not understand the reticence of the cornish people they do not like to talk to outsiders and i'm convinced that if it had not been for tony's presence in the area as a trusted local the affair would have never been made public that's also true if he had never been there to hoax it but anyways <laughs> the, the coast the case of the french girls for example Tony wrote to me in 1995 explaining how he had become involved. The French girls, and this is a quote from now Shields, the French girls were students at at Caneborn Tech, now known as Cornwall College, lodging in Red Roof. I think they were on some sort of summer school course. Their landlady phoned me about this sighting. Remember at the time, I was getting quite a lot of media coverage. People reported weird-ish to me. 
<laughs> Two years later, the creature reappeared when an enormous bird-like creature was seen flying over the Halford River and into the trees near Greb Greb Beach. What do you make of that? Um, Sounds like a lot of weird ish. Well, I'm not. I'm not really sure. I what censored Jonathan, myself. I'm oh. not. Re- I'm not really sure what Jonathan Downs is trying to say there because. You're he's, making it sound like he's talking shields up and saying that, you know, he's not responsible for hoaxing it. Yeah, because he's saying that the Cornish people, like a lot of people when it comes to cryptozoology sightings, they don't want to just tell everyone about it. And so Doc Shields was a local in the area known for doing that stuff, known for dealing with these things. And so he's saying that if it wasn't for Doc Shields' presence in that area, we probably wouldn't even know about the Isle Man. Things would have been seen and just hushed up. You get what I'm saying? I get what you're saying, but I find it interesting. Um, The article that you read from, I know that you said you had to go on the way back machine and you like had to go all the way back to 2009. Do you have a date for when that article was actually written? Is there any text that says when the article was written? Because I have information from 2009 when Darren Nash did a documentary. It was only 10 minutes, did a mini 10 minute documentary on the L man and spoke to Jonathan Downs on camera. And when asked about if the L man might be a flesh and blood creature, Jonathan Downs literally laughed and scoffed and said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And went on to say that he thinks uh, Tony invented the owl man for fun. And he refers to him as Tony, as he has done so in the article that you've been reading from. He says, I think it's something Tony invented for fun. Oh, great. Uh- a little bit of a a heel turn right there yeah well i don't have the exact date this was written but using the way back machine i was able to find that the earliest that this page because the way the way back machine works is someone has to like save the page almost so the earliest it was saved was 2003 so so there must have been a change of opinion from yeah. the time Jonathan Downs wrote that article to 2009. And who knows, maybe there might even be a different opinion now. I don't have any further updated information from Jonathan Downs. But in 2009, in that Darren Nash documentary, straight up laughed at the idea of the <laughs> Owlman being real and straight up said he thinks it's something that Tony invented for fun. But in that same documentary, doesn't he say... Something along the lines of Doc Shields made it up in the sense that he almost conjured it up and that when people saw it, no one was more surprised than he himself. I think that has to do with Mogar. Oh. Because um, Doc Shields... The story with Mogar, which is, this is another tangent, but (laughs) Mogar is a Cornish sea serpent and Doc Shields had heard the stories of the creature and thought it'd be a good publicity gimmick to say that he was going to invoke the thing and he surprised himself by actually succeeding. Um, Mm. So maybe you're having some thought overlap in that. Probably. Because... There's, there's another documentary where Doc Shields himself says he was surprised that he actually saw Morgar and whatever else. Yeah. Well, I have another scandal involving Owlman and Doc Shields occurring in the 1980s. Uh-oh. What happened? So... In Halloween 1986, Doc Shields was accused by the Bishop of Truro and local newspapers of committing committing unspeakable acts of blasphemy in Monon Church while attempting to invoke the Owl Man. He probably had his daughters dancing naked in the church. (laughs) (laughs) 1986, they're probably dancing to George Michaels. (laughs) Oh, boy. 
Okay, so this is... You know what's really funny? I feel... I have to remind myself that this did not happen that long ago. Like, all of this stuff... Like, the 70s is not that long ago. Like, this isn't some old ancient story. This isn't some old ancient wizard. This is someone who is Uh, still alive. Like, Doc Shields is still around. And, like, I don't know. That's just weird for me. Possibly all of that. I know Jonathan Downs is still around. Yeah. And so it's, like, possibly everyone involved in this is still alive. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Especially if they were a teenager in the 70s, all these girls growing up. Like, I, I saw an owl man when I was a teenager. Right? So, this is what I got here. This is what I got here. So, Shields confided in Downs, I guess. And I include this quote. It's not really necessary, but it's just kind of funny to me. Where he talks about this kind of scandal in the 1986 Quote, I did a few bits and pieces inside the church. There was a lot of misreporting that I was throwing out challenges to God and saying I'd smack him in the gob. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think God has a gob in there. I don't think God has a gob, and I wouldn't do that anyway to the deity. He'd give me a harder smack back, wouldn't he? (laughs) (laughs) So, and, and Jonathan Downs did some investigative work and apparently pieced together the true story of what happened Halloween 1986, which was Shields had visited the Monon church, but he was there only with one dude, a shy bloke named Dave. And apparently Shields just went into the church, muttered some stuff in a foreign language under his breath, and then turned around and walked out. Hmm. And that's but when he was approached by me. he was approached by a local radio team that had asked him what he was going to do for Halloween, and he said, "Buy me a drink, and I'll show you." But apparently, he's he can drink, so they just kept buying him drinks all night long, and he just kept blabbering on about nothing, I guess, and so they just. <laughs> gave up and left and concocted this story that he was invoking owl man inside the church on Halloween and this, that, and the other. Hmm. You know, that is a good party trick. <laughs> Someone asks you, Hey, what are you, what are you doing this tonight or uh, this Halloween? Right, buy me a drink and I'll show you. And they just proceed, just get drunk because you keep having them buy drinks. <laughs> this was my plan. I thought I'd get drunk and you'd buy me drinks. <laughs> <laughs> that was his plan for Halloween. They played right into it. That's true. Do you guys have any further sightings? Yes. 1989, perhaps? Mm-hmm. Which is, if we're talking about the same thing, the first time a male bears witness to the owl man. And the first time the sighting was not directly linked to Doc Shields. Mm -hmm. Mm. So what does this mean? I wish I freaking knew. Well, it's 1989. The Berlin Wall had just fallen and we're getting crazy. Well, here's what I got for this 1989 sighting. Um, This was an intentional venture to the church to look for the owl man. It was a couple who have been referred to as Gavin and Sally. Not their real names. But wouldn't it be funny if it was the same Sally years later going back mm. to look for the owl man? Dude, that's that's our A24 movie pitch. But what if it is? Okay, wait, how many years <laughs> is that? 1989 <laughs> minus 76? Yeah. 89 minus 76 is what? I can't do math fast. 89 minus 76. So it'd be 13 years later. And so if it was Sally Chap... uh, Should be 27? Sally Sally Chapman, Uh, 27. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was... So she'd be 27. She'd be an adult. It could be her! What if it's her, guys? Anyway. I don't think it is. (laughs) Gavin and Sally. I feel like if it was her, she would like make mention of that when she talks about it but anyway 
Um, they went out looking for the owl man and they found it. So the young man stated that as they were walking with a flashlight, they came upon a large tree with a dark colored object sitting in the branches. They approached the branch, shined the flashlight on the object. And as soon as the light came in contact with the object, it began to move. The creature again stretched out its human shaped body and appeared to be nearly five feet in length and unfolded the large brown and gray colored wings, which possessed no hands. And it wrapped its black taloned two toed feet, which apparently were attached to unnaturally long ankles around the thick tree limb and jerked its head downwards and towards the terrified young couple. The light illuminated the red within the creature's eyes and showed its large gaping mouth. And then the owl man jumped up off the branch, folded its legs up towards its body and took off into the night sky. And terrified at what they had just witnessed, Gavin and Sally fled to the woods. Um, and that is what I have for that. I don't know who they reported that to. I don't know how that story came to be. I don't know if they... It sounds like they didn't call up Doc Shields. <laughs> but. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'll, I'll browse around in this article. Maybe it's in here. But because uh, Jonathan Downs has like the exact word for word, like what was reported okay. for that, which I'm not going to read because you basically said all of it. OK. Oh, keeping keeping in line, the, the people, the witnesses may have changed, but the M.O. stays the same. He's oh, hanging out, stretching out his wings, flying. They reported it to Jonathan Downs. Mm. Mm. Or actually, it was him, because I'll read the last paragraph, which he talks about, which Gavin, Gavin's the one who reported it. And so this is what he says. We had a pretty good idea what it looked like. We didn't know what to do about it and essentially vowed never to tell anyone. I last saw Sally about two years ago and talked about it then. She was as unkeen to share the information then as she was earlier. And I promised I wouldn't tell anyone about her involvement but I could do what I liked with my interpretation. I respect this and have never disclosed any information about her. It's very interesting to me because, you know, if this was an intentional venture out to try and find the owl man and you found the owl man, how are you going to not like want to share information about it? Because it scared you, bro. Yeah, uh, it's the definition yeah, of, of F around and find out. I guess. But, um, more sightings i do have more me too alex do you have more sightings i just have the year 1995 and uh the a supposed uh sighting in 2000 the year 2000 yeah uh, but i don't have any details just those years oh, okay so there's a brief statement that floats around the internet saying that sightings would continue on into the 1990s and blah, 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 blah. Don't know how true that is. Don't know. Didn't find any names attached to that until 1995. Mm. It was a young anonymous witness who was a female tourist from Chicago who happened to be a student working at the Chicago Field Museum. She claimed to see a bird man with a white face, wide mouth, glowing eyes, and clawed wings. And she described it as nothing less than a vision from hell. I love that I actually have this statement. Um, she recounted her experience in a letter written to the night editor of the Western Morning News. So, like, we know who she wrote to. And I yeah, love his, that. His name was Simon <laughs> Parker, by the way. Simon Parker. She said, I am a student of marine biology at the Field Museum Chicago on the last day of summer vacation in England. Last Sunday evening, I had a most unique and frightening experience in the wooded area near the old church at Mon in Cornwall. I experienced what I can only describe as a vision from hell. The time was 15 minutes after nine, more or less, and I was walking along a narrow track through the trees. I was halted in my tracks when some 30 meters ahead, I saw a monstrous bird man thing. It was the size of a man with a ghastly face, a wide mouth, glowing eyes, and pointed ears. And it had huge clawed wings and was covered in feathers of silvery gray. The thing had long, the thing had long bird legs, which terminated in large black claws. It saw me and rose floating towards me. 
me. I just screamed and then turned and ran for my life. The whole experience was totally irrational and dreamlike. Friends tell me that there is a tradition of a phantom owl man in that district. Now I know why. I have seen the phantom myself. And she ends it by saying, please don't publish my real name or address. This could adversely affect my career. Now I have to rethink my worldview entirely. Whoa. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Downs admits that he himself has has her information as well, but never reached out because she he respected her desire to remain anonymous. Mm. So wh- where did she write the paper to, or uh, what was this? Did she, you said she wrote a letter to someone, or she wrote a letter to the night editor of the Western Morning News. So she wrote to the news because she wanted people to know. Okay, I was just curious because you said that the guy's name was Simon Parker. So, yeah, Simon P- Parker, the night editor. Yeah, the night editor. He gets this crazy letter, goes in, tells his boss, "I got this crazy letter about you know, check it out." And he goes, "Damn it, Parker! I want you to get out there and get me some pictures of Owl Man." <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. Wow. You tied it all back to Spider-Man. Uh, we always do. All right. So before we go any further. Yeah. This, where, is, where we this, at? Is, this is my theory here. Everything has been tied besides this 1995 sighting. Everything can be tied to either Downs or Shields. I think it's... I'm thinking. I'm thinking so. I, I really think so because these things just like aren't adding up. But Downs writes this in his blog about Shields. After all, by his own admission, he is a charlatan and a thimble rigger. And he has even told me not to invest belief in anything, especially him. And this is a man I count as a close and dear friend. The discovery of Gavin and his succinct and believable eyewitness testimony provided an invaluable corroboration to the vast body of Shields channeled evidence and has persuaded even some noted skeptics that there is something to the story after all. But who did Gavin report to? Self-confessed buddy buddy with Doc Shields, Jonathan Downs. You know what I mean? It's like... Well, what I find interesting is a parent, and again, I don't know if this is true. I don't know where this comes from. This comes from, but Jonathan Downs apparently investigated the Chicago marine biologist sighting by, uh, because she get, she, even though she didn't give her name. There was an address, I'm assuming on the envelope that it was sent in. Perhaps I'm wrong. I'm just making an assumption. Um, but Downs tried to contact her and she was not registered as living there and no department chief that he spoke to on the telephone had heard of her. So now you just said all of that, but now I'm saying Jonathan Downs is doubting the Chicago sighting because he couldn't find any proof of a marine biologist student Existed. living at the I, I don't know what's going on but then again also if I if I try to argue against what I just said perhaps she wrote it from a different address maybe the address that she wrote on the envelope is not where she actually lived because that's what I do if I was trying to be anonymous mm-hmm. I put a different return address on the envelope exactly so fatal mistake of one to be anonymous, including your actual address with the letter. Mm-hmm. But even then, isn't that extra weird? The one, the one sighting that wasn't reported to either Shields or Downs is the only one that Downs questions. It's mm-hmm. the only sighting that he's like, I don't know if this happened, and it's like, mm, mm. <laughs> marine bi. Marine biologist, you say, from Chicago, eh? Well, if you want to cut Downs and Shields completely out of this, we can talk about the 2019 supposed sighting. The what? 
Yeah, there was a, two, a 2019 sighting. <laughs> oh. I mean, we might as well talk about it. We since, should. You know, we should. Yeah, what is it? Lay so, it out. Lay it out. So basically, there's this guy who's a ghost hunter. He's from Falmouth. Um, he claimed to have spotted the Alamann and that his friend got attacked by it. This guy's name is Mark Davies. He was in the graveyard with his friend Chris Power, who's 36 and from Manchester. Um, Mark had said he he's also on the side of the argument for ley lines. He said there's ley lines which are under the ground near the church and they give off paranormal activity. He says there was a hissing in the trees and you could hear flapping. I heard it go right over my head and I was shocked. That's when I saw the figure and it had horns on its head. It was mad. On the meter I had, which picks up electric magnetic energy that we use to detect ghosts i was getting conscious replies to my questions through it that's telling me that there's demonic energy and that it wasn't safe and my mate got attacked he had scratches on his arm his camera broke too he didn't see anything he just felt this surge of energy he didn't realize till about half an hour later when he felt something burning it's not a place i would advise anyone to go there alone let's put it that way um i think i might have misspoke that quote that i just read comes from mark davies mm -hmm. i did not misspeak i was correct um mark davies is the, the main investigator his friend is chris power chris is the one who got attacked mark is the one who saw the thing mm -hmm. so you're like where's the proof well he There's claims to have captured the l man on video during this 2019 investigation that took place in august um Davies and Power can both be seen in the video entering the graveyard through a gate inscribed with the Cornish phrase that means it is good to draw nigh to the Lord. Um, and there'll be a link to the video on our blog so you can go watch that if you want to see it. And at minute marker 1714, Davies is filming while holding the K2 meter in front of himself and he asks um, a series of questions that all basically mean the same thing. Is there a creature that lives here is there a creature that lives here a spirit is there a creature that lives here like an owl um and the k2 meter does light up briefly following those questions which some people can raise an eyebrow at and the camera pans from left to right during davy's questions and in the right hand corner of a frame you can see a silhouetted figure in the distance the figure appears to have horns on its head and is hunched over and very tall according to the caption added in this video and seeing as Chris was right behind me, I cannot explain this. For one, he does not have horns on his head. Reads the next mm. caption. I watched the video. Mm. It's not impressive. There's like, what are you looking at? <laughs> exactly. Uh, the leading skeptical explanation for the shadowy figure is that it's just a gravestone. Um, since the camera does not pan back to the area where the creature was spotted. It also tells me that he didn't see it in real time. This was one of those mm. events where he was reviewing the video and saw the figure. Because obviously, if you're in the moment and you see that figure, you're going to stay on that figure, especially if you're a ghost hunter investigating the area. But Tobias Wayland of the Singular Fortean Society states um, that video of the same location with better lighting would be necessary to show that there's nothing present that could have created the silhouette. Um, others say a hoax can't be ruled out since the audience cannot visually confirm powers whereabouts at the time of the sighting. Mm. So mm. that is the only supposed video evidence of the L man. There are absolutely no other photos, no other video evidence. Yep. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing. Well, once again, after a crazy episode of, looking into some kind of crazy cryptid myth or legend or left with a big heaping helping load of nothing yeah well, can we talk or... about some theories oh uh, yeah no my give me, give me one second jasmine says no just give me this one second because no i read an article from cornwall live news they did a story on the Owlman um, back in April of 2020, so not that long ago. Um, and some excerpts from that say this. Although many Cornish people still remember the first Owlman story, when Cornwall Live News decided to drive down to the small village to find out more, people said that they had not heard its name for many, many years. 
They asked a local woman who was living in the village at the time why the tales sank into oblivion. And she said, I haven't heard it mentioned for years and years since it first happened, actually. It was a media event at the time, which side note, that's the fact that it was a media event ties back to Shields because that's what he was all about. He was about like causing a scene and getting things out there and yep. whatever. He was the greatest showman kind of guy. Yeah. So people were scared to go to the church afterwards. The owl man looked quite menacing from the pictures and drawings made by the girls involved. I don't want to see him. Thank you very much. And she explained that the reason why the owl man is not a popular story in the village anymore is because the population has changed a lot since the original reports, which mm. I guess makes sense. Like it's probably like a generation because what it, it's been like 40 years so she says the older people have passed away or left and we've had a lot of newcomers in the village who wouldn't really know about it so yeah again these most recent encounters which there aren't very many mm -hmm. but they're the significant ones because they're the only reports that aren't linked in some way with shields yes speaking of shields and media events and things like that another theory that we kind of mentioned at the very beginning of the episode is the mothman owl man link mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because here is the very significant thing and i was surprised i kind of put this together so even though the events of mothman in point pleasant happened in 1966 through 67 Mm -hmm. John Keel didn't publish the Mothman prophecies until 1975. Owlman started up in 1976. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and like Mothman prophecies was pretty popular when it came out. Like, so you're mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, I'm going to ride the curtails of the Mothman prophecies and John Keel and, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm pretty sure Shields was a fan of of john keel right oh yeah oh an yeah admirer per se um so do with that what you will stinky over here <laughs> oh <laughs> no but i also got this if you want to go with the whole thing is not made up but it is made up but not in the way you think made up we've talked about this before on the show the idea of tulpas existing mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think this is cool i pulled up like this cool kind of snippet on tulpas and kind of where the idea of tulpas even comes from because if you know what a tulpa is the idea is self-explanatory but i want to read this because it's kind of cool this also comes from jonathan downs i'll be honest um the veteran explorer and mystic Alexandra David Neal, writing in With Magicians and Mystics in Tibet from 1931, tells how certain Buddhist monks can create living thought forms called tulpas. She claimed that she managed to create one of her home, of her own. <laughs> the image of a fat and jolly monk who was seen at, on at least one occasion by an independent witness. She warns, however, once the tulpa is endowed with enough vitality to play the part of a real being, it tends to free itself from its maker's control. In the case of her tulpa, this happened and she described how the monk became thinner and less jolly and how slowly his face assumed a vaguely mocking, sly, malignant look. He Ooh. became more troublesome and bold. In short, he escaped my control. Mm. and so to really tie it all together is owl man a tulpa created by doc shields don't think it don't say it that's the rule with a tulpa no i don't think so no <laughs> that was a pretty good one uh my favorite explanation is um I got it from uh, the purveyor of possible cryptid knowledge. The cryptid wikis with a Z yes. offers up this startling and controversial explanation. It is what as it follows. The Mothman, period. 
<laughs> it's the Mothman. Yeah. Amazing. That, that's, uh, they literally have explanations. The Mothman, oh, period. Man. I mean, there are some people that feel that the Owl Man is this in the same family as the Mothman. Maybe not the same exact creature, but you know. Really hey, maybe he it. he fled the he fled the country after the Silver Lake Bridge collapse. Maybe. So way back at the beginning of this episode, when we were talking about the first sighting, we kind of mentioned, oh well, maybe Melling reached out to Shields because he thought shields was to blame for like invoking the monster Mm -hmm. um there are other people who have speculated that whether it was shields or not the owl man was invoked by occult rituals that apparently happened as far back as 1937 but you know the typical dark magic raising of monsters type stuff or there's the really level-headed approach besides that it's completely made up but well before before we pass the it's completely made up thing there are some other points that we can make about it potentially being made up like there's 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 some things that you can point your finger at okay tell me so along with you know us and other people there's someone else who suggests that the whole thing was a hoax by shields um their name is gareth medway um they say Owlman showed himself only to adolescent girls on holiday who afterwards would just chance to meet Doc Shields, tell him their stories, and then never be seen or heard from again. Mm-hmm. Three of the girls produced drawings of what they had seen, though there is some doubt about one, which is variously described as by June Melling or based on a sketch by June Melling, which is not the same thing. Um, Mm -hmm. So if it is her original drawing, then like the other two, she had remarkably excellent drawing abilities for a pre-teenager. In fact, one might have guessed all of the pictures to have been the work of a professional artist, perhaps Doc Shields. Going back to that. Which he was, wasn't he? We talked Mm -hmm. about that in the Loch Ness Monster episode. He was an artist. I think he's a musician as well. Oh, man. Barbara Perry and Sally Chapman also both wrote a brief description of the monster underneath their drawings, which Eli read earlier, and their handwriting is of interest. Now, graphologists know that there are some writing habits that can be consciously altered, for instance, whether the letters are joined up or not, whereas others are very difficult to disguise. And Chapman's and Perry's handwriting are very different in their alterable habits, Perry joins up some of her letters, but Chapman does not. But they are remarkably similar to the unalterable in the unalterable ones. Does that make sense? I had a lot of big words in that last sentence. They're basically saying you can consciously change the way you write, but you will still have some underlying habits in your handwriting. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Chapman and Perry's handwriting, yes, they look different because it would have been intentional to make them look different but there are still things in their their handwritings that are the same, Mm -hmm. Um, such as the way that they wrote the word monster are virtually identical and they share several other habits, both putting the dot over the I to the right of the letter and beginning the crossbar of the T at the upright stroke. Uh, So one could almost conclude that they were one person pretending to be two. And... Mm. Yeah. Who <laughs> we? So that's not looking good. That's what we say uh, about that. Um, yeah, and then Jonathan Downs did his own investigation of the Owl Man, as we know. And I don't know if you have information on this, Eli, since you read that site. But apparently, he located a man who had said he had seen it when he was a boy, and his sketch looked like an imitation of the girl's sketches rather than an independent drawing of something he may have seen Mm -hmm. i did not come across that information uh but yeah that's uh it's not looking good for the owl man (laughs) it is with as many sightings as there are because what's crazy is so if you guys have been listening to our past couple of recent episodes you'll know that you know we did the skunk ape and we only intended it to be one episode but it ended up being two because there was so much to talk about and so much to dive into and with the owl man i feel like there's a lot but there's also nothing (laughs) yeah 
like simultaneously there's all of these sightings but what strength do they hold not much it's kind of the owl man's kind of lame too with all, all these sightings the same story of him like flying towards and hissing at teenage girls and then he flies yeah. away which is interesting because you would think that if someone were to encounter the same creature, that their experience would be the same. So it's not that crazy to be like, oh, the same exact thing happened to me. I saw the creature, it hissed, it flew off. Oh, that happened to me too. I saw the creature, its eyes were glowing, it hissed at me, it flew off. Like, it makes sense that if you're encountering the same creature, that it would exhibit the same behaviors. But the fact that there are no variances at all, and it's always the same Mm -hmm. but i guess you could say the opposite like let's think if the opposite were happening and every single sighting was different we'd be like "Mm, there's inconsistencies here yeah so so what do you want to what are Uh, we going to say about that you know there at least some cryptids have some kind of teeth to them so there's a story of them carrying off someone's dog or like you know someone getting more damage done like a shed being ripped apart or right someone's I, car getting totaled the like with the thing, just kind of yeah. hanging out well like you could point to like a lot of bigfoot sightings are more or less the same but there's enough variation to people are in different areas the kinds of people seeing it are different mm-hmm. you know uh or even mothman if you want to c- compare something close is like completely different people seeing it you know it's not always teenage girls in the same town i mean it is in the same town but like you know different areas and even being reported to different people you know like john keel didn't receive every single report you know he took all the reports after the fact and compiled them together but not all the reports went to him you know they were going to different people so i don't know there's a lot of things that are like after covering so many cryptid cases and looking and seeing you know, certain things that have to happen, this is kind of missing from this one. Right. Well, last theory before we get into our main event. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <sighs> Some people say that it could be a Eurasian eagle owl, mm-hmm. which, or the Bubo Bubo scientific name. The Bubo Bubo. <laughs> is one of the largest species of owls with the females, which are the larger ones in most owl species, uh, reaching a length. So a length, like you got to think when they're flying, so kind of like a height of 30 inches, which is like two and a half feet tall with a wingspan reaching six foot two inches. Like that is a very large bird. Mm -hmm. and lives in that area has ear tufts which could be mistaken as horns i forget maybe i think it might have been darren nash who kind of pointed out that they these types of owls typically use churches to kind of hang out and live in Mm. so like old abandoned churches which there's plenty of Mm -hmm. i think there's a couple of people who kind of just point that out another one is author joan nickel it says yeah. church towers are common nesting places for, for owls. So then again, I don't think so, dude. I don't think the evidence points to any of the witnesses being real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Forget the creature existing. What about the witnesses? Are they <laughs> even real? Yeah, where are they at, bro? Like, because they're named. Like, they have full-on names. Where are they at, though? Just start going on Facebook and just Facebook messaging every single person named what What are their names? Like Sally, Sally Chapman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't ever remember the first names of the Melling girls. June Melling, Vicky Melling. Like, let's just go on Facebook and just start okay. messaging all that. Did you see the Owl Man in 1976? Yeah. <laughs> if so, how many did you see? <laughs> All right, so <sighs> what an episode. And breaking now... from the chaos of the episode, we're now breaking into a different kind of chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, 
it's the cryptid coliseum mm, mm, mm. so bear with me because this is gonna be rough just like this episode <laughs> we come upon the bone white coliseum hovering in the night sky Coliseum itself is just hovering in the air. It's it can do a it's lot. It's above of the church. It's above Mon and Church. It's it's been established in previous uh, cryptid battles <laughs> that it can fly, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It can fly. Yes. It can swim. It can float. <laughs> I think one of them had tank wheels, and it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it crushing the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. So uh, right now it's floating up in the sky. You can pack. You can picture the you know, spotlights shining up over it, making X's and, you know, up in the clouds above. And then you see a shape kind of fly in between, in the light, just kind of flying around up there. And then it lands on one of the tall spires surround that make up, you know, the kind of structure of the Colosseum. It lands, the crowd's going wild. They're like, owl man, owl man, owl man. It's looking out over the stadium and then it hoots. And the audience, everyone in the stadium is just prepubescent and adolescent girls. (laughs) They're the only ones who can see it. Like an instinct (laughs) concert. Uh, Don't forget, there's one boy in there. One boy. (laughs) It looks out over the Coliseum, out over the empty battlefield. It sees the gate start to open. Go, Alex. Oh, yeah, you do the sound. (laughs) (laughs) Out comes this three-foot-tall creature wearing a blue cloak covered in white stars. Is it a reptile? No, it's an amphibian. (laughs) It's the frogman with a full-on cloak magician's hat and a wand to go along with it oh yeah (laughs) you okay yeah i'm great (laughs) (laughs) i just i feel like i know where this is going i certainly (laughs) hope not (laughs) the frogman hops out it starts looking around it croaks in confusion it can't see its enemy until it hoots and it looks up and starts shooting fireballs out of its magic wand at the owl man. (laughs) The owl man dodges, he flies around, ducking left and right, dodging all these fireballs. And then he goes in for the kill, trying to swoop in, but a well-placed fireball hits it in its left wing and it goes spiraling out of control, crashes into the, crashes into the floor of the Coliseum with some bones crunching in there. The frogman begins to hop over, croaking and gloating over his defeated enemy. He gets up close. He pumps up the crowd, starts charging up his wand, points it at his fallen foe, and the owl man springs up, grabs the owl, uh, the frogman by his shoulders, and starts going straight up. <laughs> It starts to hoot at him with supersonic hoots that start to hurt the frogman's ears. The frogman tries to get off his shot, but the owl man smacks smacks his wand out of his hand, falls to the Coliseum floor below, which is now hundreds of feet below him. They're going up and up and up. But the frogman has one more trick up his sleeve. He starts to expand his chest and his His belly gets bigger and bigger. The owl man's worried he's going to lose his grip. He's going to drop his opponent far too soon for a lethal blow. But before the the grip gets too loose, the frogman lets out a supercharged ribbit and explodes the owl man into a puff of feathers. (laughs) However... The owl man gets the last laugh because the frog man plummets to the Coliseum floor <laughs> and explodes into chunks as he collides with it. <laughs> as the crowd goes wild, 
the gatekeepers let in a couple of chupacabras to lick up the blood. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I gotta be honest. I'm I'm sad that they're uh they both died. Uh, I'm proud of the frogman, my my fellow Ohioan. But I I do have to say, when I said earlier I thought I knew where this was going. Owls eat frogs, so I thought that <laughs> the owl man was just gonna feast on the frog man's legs. Dang! Oh man! Uh, he took some advice from those uh, French teenage girls and was trying to eat frog legs. <laughs> you know, I will say this: at least in my mind, the way that this works is the cryptid Colosseum is like Looney Tunes. Creatures can explode. Creatures can splat, but they can also come back. They can respawn. The owl man, <laughs> the owl man and the frog man are not forever gone. No, they'll be back. Oh, I almost yeah. thought I almost thought it would be it would be great to have a running gag to where every cryptid fights the chupacabra this tone. But then I was like, <laughs> no, no. <Yeah. laughs> uh. That was beautiful. Mm. Well Thanks. done. Violent, but beautiful. <laughs> when are they not violent? Uh, we're amping it up, though, this tome. I like to think. <laughs> uh, we, we're working out some demons this tome. Come along with us. Taking out, taking out some aggression. Well, <sighs> I think that wraps up our uh, Owlman discussion. Mm. Lots, of, lots of talk. We came for the bloodlust. We feel sated. We're happy. Cryptid battle happened with this uh, silly owl man. Mm-hmm. Gave him some teeth finally. Yep. <laughs> and uh, this will be the third time that I say it in this episode. Um, but if you want to read all of the sources, if you want to read some of the same articles that we did, if you want to mm-hmm. look deeper in to some of the, the websites and the books that we consulted for this episode, you can find our full list of sources listed on this week's blog post. Head over to cryptidcampfire.com for all of that information. We like to give credit to our sources, so please go and take a look at that. Now we've come to the part of the show where we like to thank a Patreon for all their support and helping us get together and do a lot of this cryptid fun. Uh, so for today's shout out, we'd like to thank River Bauer uh, for being a Patreon. We really appreciate your support. We hope you enjoy the Patreon only episodes because uh, we got some more fun stuff this year planned for you. Oh, yeah. And if you want to get possibly shouted out on a future episode of Cryptid Campfire, check out our Patreon page exclusive episodes, wallpapers, yeah. fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, it was a little bit of a wild ride, but I think we had fun. Yeah. Uh, it was like Mr. Toad's wild ride, but with a, <laughs> a frog man and an owl man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you guys next week. We want to thank you guys for listening to Cryptid Campfire. We really appreciate it, and we'd appreciate it even more if you left us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It helps us rank, and more people can find us and join the campfire. If you haven't yet, consider following us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. That's at Cryptid Campfire on all three. Be sure to check out our website, cryptidcampfire.com, where you can find campfire t-shirts and other merch, as well as our weekly blog, expanding upon what we talk about in the episodes. If you've done all that, consider subscribing to our Patreon page. $5 a month gets you access to exclusive episodes and wallpapers that haven't been released anywhere else. For the price of a coffee, you will be directly helping us make this show the best it can be. If you want to follow our hosts, you can find their personal profiles on Instagram at Jasmine May With. That's J-A-S-M-I-N-E-M-A-E-W-I-T-H. At Alex Dai Kaiju, that's at A L E X D A I K A I J U, and at the Eli Watson. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.